Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Liberty Weekly Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Patrick McFarlane. This episode is number 219, and the show notes may be found at libertyweekly.net forward slash 219. And uh, I just got back from vacation with my family. Uh, We had gone to visit my in-laws in Utah. We're there for about a week, and then I went to Childerberg, and then I was at home last week for like four or five days. I think I mentioned that in last week's episode. And then this weekend, I decided to take my family um, on vacation again. So my wife got back on Friday, last Friday, from Utah, and we decided to stay in the Twin Cities for the weekend, just kind of hitting up some of our old haunts. And taking the kids to the Minnesota Children's Museum, which was very memorable, a whole lot of fun. And so we we also took a look at the old apartment that we used to live in on Summit in, in Grand Avenue, kind of if you're familiar with St. Paul, which is the area that we lived in when, when I started the podcast and when I was going to law school. So that was a whole lot of fun. And then we came back on Sunday afternoon which was two days ago, and I just was completely exhausted. I got all I didn't come out with a column last week uh, because of recovering from Childerberg and that vacation and all that stuff. And now I have I have a trial coming up next week that I've been trying to prepare for, and work has been hectic. And of course, you know, as an entrepreneur and a small business owner with my own solo practice, I. I have to put that first, and so that's the reason for this late episode coming out and for what the episode is, which is a run of my recent interview uh, with Hervoy Morick from Geopolitics and Empire. He runs the – he's also a host of his own show, the Hervoy Morick Show on TNT Radio, which is something that's kind of been uh, picking up steam. I've noticed – you know, a few people that I, I like and appreciate in the anti-war, anti-imperialist scene, uh, I think Misty, her her handle is at Sarcasm and Stardust. She's the host, co-host of Facts on the Ground show. Um, she's a big Julian Assange activist, and she is also a host on TNT Radio along with her voice. And I think there's a few other hosts that I I like and appreciate as well. Uh, but her voice is he's also the host of Geopolitics and Empire, which is a show that I really do enjoy. And I see a lot of people that I like uh, on that show that he interviews. So uh, it was really an honor for him to invite me to appear on TNT Radio. And so I thought I'd share that with you guys, but I, but I think you'll appreciate this. And if you haven't listened to her voice, he's a very affable guy, and uh, I, I appreciate his hosting duties. He always has something interesting to say. So if you haven't already, check out Geopolitics and Empire, also Facts on the Ground, um, at FOTG underscore show on Twitter. Uh, let's see, Geopolitics and Empire's at Geopolitics underscore EMP on Twitter geopoliticsandempire.com. So announcing you guys that I, I have my new substack at libertyweekly.club, and I'm just going to call it my new substack to avoid confusion, but it's my new membership website. We're still looking to launch that. Kind of got um, a big wrench thrown in with all the vacations and just being incredibly crazy busy with uh, my personal life and with my business as well, my law practice. So head on over to libertyweekly.club. We we had two new members, and actually I I should just read off the members here. People who did join on Substack but have been ported over and are new members of the the new libertyweekly.club. Okay, shout out to Troy, shout out to Scott, shout out to Drew Cook, Clean Libertarian. Um Scott, the host of uh, Why I Am Anti-War podcast on on Twitter. I don't know if he's been releasing stuff lately, but Scott Spaulding was a guest to the show. Uh, check out his episodes. Uh, shout out to Nick. Shout out to Kyle Matovic. Shout out to CD McRae, also a guest on the show. Uh, shout out to Adam C. Melanie. Adi. Troy. Uh, Deacon Law. And... FMC196 and Zygodactyl01. 
some of you I, I don't have I just have your email address and I don't have your actual names, but uh those are the supporting members of the show on Substack now ported over to the new membership website, what they're not telling you, which is at libertyweekly.club. So thanks so much to you guys. Really appreciate your support. I incredibly value everybody that would help me um, help support this work. So, all right. Well, without further ado, thanks for hanging in there for these announcements. And here is my interview on the Hervoy Morix show with Hervoy Morick, the host of Geopolitics and Empire on TNT Radio, which you can find at tntradio.live. He's been doing a lot of commentary on, on COVID. He's, a, I think, academic ethics professor who was run out. He's got a new book coming out, but uh, Night News Australia reports, as COVID-19 deaths remain stubbornly high in Australia, new international research has found it may be possible to perform mouth-to-mouth CPR while wearing a face mask to keep the virus uh, at bay. He says, next level insanity, says the psychiatrist. We really are in clown world, uh, clown world, monkeypox world, monkey. It's a monkey world order, uh, and we've got CTVnews.ca, official mainstream news, says that uh, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration (FDA) has raised concerns about a possible risk of heart inflammation from Novavax's COVID-19 uh, vaccine. Conspiracy theory. I guess the mainstream media have now become conspiracy theorists. Last week, it was the UK Telegraph saying AstraZeneca COVID vaccines are giving you Guillain Barre. Now it's uh, CTV News Canada saying uh, you can get heart inflammation and myocarditis from uh, Novavax vaccine. They're all becoming conspiracy theorists now. I really don't know <laughs> what's going on here. Um, meanwhile, we had the Chinese aircraft. Uh, in, intercepts uh, a RAF plane and puts crew at uh, risk. So uh, a Chinese military fighter has flown dangerously close to Australian uh, aircraft over the South China Sea. Um, and it's funny, the Global Times response, that's the Chinese mainstream media saying, uh, and who, uh, I forget his last name, but he's, he's the former editor of Global Times. He said, I would like to tell Canada and Australia to be strategically professional first. If you want to come to China's peripheral areas to stir up trouble, you will have to endure tits-for-tat countervailing action from the Chinese side. So things are heating up uh, everywhere. So that's, you know, uh, Canada, Australia, and China. We've got uh, South Korea and U.S. now fire missiles in warning to North Korea. South Korea and the U.S. launched eight missiles uh, today in response to a volley of ballistic missiles fired by North Korea. So things are certainly heating up everywhere, whether it's Korea, Taiwan, the Indo-Pacific, Japan, Ukraine, uh, you know, the summit of America's down here, you name it. There's no shortage of uh, clown world (laughs) events uh, Victor Davis Hansen, uh, who I'm a fan of, he writes for American Greatness, uh, American Intellectual. He says that he wrote a new piece, The Sovietization of American Life. Behind all our disasters, there looms an ideology, a creed that ignores cause and effect in the real world without a shred of concern for the damage done to those outside the nomenclatura. I mean, it was back in 2006 I decided to permanently expatriate from the United Soviet States uh, of America. And it's certainly going along that path um we've got the economist now the new cover of the economist just published talking about nuclear war uh a new nuclear era and it talks about uh, it says with his threats to use the bomb russia's president has overturned the nu- nuclear order uh, and they're basically saying we are now closer to nuclear war the economist everyone's saying that now uh, soros um uh, lavrov you name it, and uh, Russian state TV now. We have um, Russian political scientist Sergei Mikheyev used Russia's uh, state-controlled TV to send a nuclear warning to the West. Speaking on Russia's China 1, he threatened that the weapons that keep reaching Ukraine will see the war in Ukraine escalate into World War III. The nuclear war is coming, he added, after warning the West uh, doesn't understand what happens 
next. And uh, another final interesting point, Lavrov had his flights canceled to Serbia after a number of countries closed their uh, airspace, uh, you know, countries around Serbia. Uh, I think, well, that included Bulgaria, uh, North Macedonia, and Montenegro had closed their airspace. The not-so-friendly skies. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's going on. We'll be right back with our guest here on TNT Radio. Conversations to inform and include. It's meant for everyday people to understand. Today's News Talk Radio, TNT. All right, coming to you live from not so sunny Mexico today, the first inaugural day of the rainy season. The electricity went out for a split second, and so did my call here on TNT. But we're back quick. Uh, don't forget to download the smartphone app, TNT Radio, uh, and subscribe to the T- TNT channels that are streaming live on. Uh, Pentagon Tube, that's YouTube, uh, Odyssey, and uh, Rumble. Joining us is Patrick McFarlane, who is the Justin Raimondo Fellow at the Libertarian Institute, where he advocates a non-interventionist foreign policy. He's a Wisconsin attorney in private practice, also the host of the Liberty Weekly podcast, which you can find and subscribe to at libertyweekly.net, where he seeks to expose establishment narratives with well-researched documentary-style content and insightful guest interviews. His work has appeared on antiwar.com and zero hedge hello patrick hey glad to be with you thanks for taking the time uh i love the work that you do i've i've had on uh, a number of your uh libertarian colleagues uh kyle uh, anzalone dave the camp uh, i've talked to scott horton on uh, scott horton on my geopolitics and empire podcast and coming up soon is connor uh freeman uh, as well and so your, your liberty weekly podcast is is well put together it's it's good stuff could you Tell us perhaps a bit about uh, the work you do. Yeah, I really, uh, I really appreciate those kind words there. Uh, so I've been doing Liberty Weekly for about five years now. Uh, I kind of started when I was in law school, when maybe I should have been spending more time doing my schoolwork, but I kind of fell in love with Austrian economics and libertarianism. I'm a child of the Ron Paul revolution. So I just kind of, I was doing that while I was going through law school, uh, reading a lot about economic theory and libertarianism and things just kind of snowballed and I decided to start the show. So I I stopped annoying my friends and family with uh, talking about this stuff all the time. But then in 2018, um, I joined the Libertarian Institute and uh, started my my show started uh, being featured there. And since then, we've just been working really hard to build a really good group of hardworking guys uh, who believe in the libertarian anti-war message uh, but also, you know, just in libertarianism in general. Yeah, so many people got slapped upside the head by the Ron Paul <laughs> revolution in the 2000s. I, I've said before, I think he was, I think, I'm not certain, I'm almost sure that he was one of the only presidential candidate that I voted for because I tend to vote on principle and not the lesser of two evils. Um, and I also fell into the Austrian school rabbit hole uh, and libertarianism. I don't identify as libertarian, but the majority of the principles I, I very much uh, enjoy. And you know, when I have a guest on for the first time, I really like to get their sort of big picture macro view on, on things, on the world, the economy, war, politics, geopolitics, and so on. And, th- and so I thought, you know, perhaps we could start with foreign policy and obviously Ukraine, which threatens to become a World War III scenario. Well, I mean, it is a World War III scenario, but, uh, you know, what, what's your sort of take on what has been going on in uh, Ukraine? Yeah, and, and I think um, I tend to share a lot of the views of, I think, a mutual friend of ours in James Corbett of the Corbett Report, um, because mm-hmm. he's, he's been someone who's really inspired me in my work since the very beginning. And I, I tend to agree with him. Uh, I know he's mentioned a lot these ideas of 3D chess, and I think he mentioned that when he was on Ge- Geopolitics and Empire the last time, that there there is – one plane that we're seeing, which is the state versus state plane, uh, but above that plane, there's also uh, you know NGOs and other private interests that are also in some ways pushing forward a mutual agenda that they may have. So I've tended to focus more on what he would call maybe the 2D aspect of this, and I haven't focused as much on the the supra state level, uh, if you will. But one thing I have focused on in my work has been. These, these calls of mounting regime change, 
uh, calls coming from especially Lindsey Graham, uh, but also um, Adam Kinzinger. And so I've written a few pieces about that. But I also tried to focus on how China fits into all of this because the the 2022 NDS, the National Defense Strategy, put forward – I think what what the the Washington establishment would like to see and what they're expecting to see. And in that, so so the last NDS came out in uh, 2018 uh, with James Mattis writing that, talking about how we've entered a new era of of great power competition, uh, a very clunky phrase for something uh, I think is pretty terrifying. Talking about how the the twenty first century is going to be defined by strategic great power competition with Russia and China. And then in 2022, you have this agenda kind of advancing forward. Um, I think they drafted the 2022 NDS before everything really kicked off in Ukraine, uh, because I think it's pretty, it's pretty uh, pie in the sky and, and way too hopeful and unrealistic because what it says is that it downgrades Russia from being a primary threat with China, being co-equal to China, but it downgrades Russia into, to something that's not quite, as big of a deal, at least in the long term. So they're still defining the long-term agenda as being um, the United States competing with China on a great level. But I think what it foretells is that they expect to be done with Russia. And I would posit that this would mean either a regime change through a proxy war, through a continued proxy war, or some kind of cut the head off the snake of Vladimir Putin. And if you listen to um, Lindsey Graham talking for you know, a few weeks before the invasion of Ukraine happened, but continuing through the last few months, you see kind of a vision of, of what that looks like. And, you know, of course, I, I focused on how Adam Kinzinger, uh, he's been an architect of the Ukraine crisis for the last 10 years or so. And he's been appearing at these um, these neoconservative think tanks like the Foreign Polish Policy Initiative, the Hudson Institute. I believe there's Atlantic Council connections there as well. So, I, I'm just kind of saying that with with the unprecedented with the unprecedented level of arms and uh, weapons that are being shipped into Ukraine, the United States seems like the stockpile is running low. That they've done so much. Of course, they've kind of emptied the economy by printing money and uh, sending funds directly to Ukraine. That I think it's it's pie in the sky if they believe that they can contain Russia and China at the same time because. If they really want to confront China, it seems like they're going to have to continue with this encirclement and this Asia pivot that started with Obama. Um, But at the same time, they're getting further and further and further committed and involved in Ukraine. Something's going to give in that area, and I think they're going to be involved much more than they would like to be. Yeah, and I appreciate what you said about the James Corbett perspective and and others in independent media. I, I'm often on the on the fence. It's hard to say, and there's there's evidence for 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 both sides. I I think you were referring to like this, you know, great reset Klaus Schwab thing, where uh, at times you see China and Russia um, applying a lot of these crazy measures, like the, the QR code, digital passports, and and cashless society thing, which seems like they're on board with this, you know, supranational, global, you know, uh, 3D, th- you know, level thing. But then you see. As, as you gave the example on the 2D level, uh, there's real pushback and, and uh, conflict between the West and, and Russia and, and China. Um, it just for a moment, it, it's been kind of, I was talking about this first hour with Jose Nino, uh, where it's sort of crystallizing now that it seems clear that the West wants to, wants to dismantle and destroy Russia. We had a piece uh, at the Atlantic recently talking about over the weekend, a decolonizing Russia, we've got the Rand Report, we've got history, you know, Napoleon trying to destroy Russia, uh, Hitler, uh, and Francis Boyle, who was my most recent guest on Geopolitics and Empire, he sent me, because uh, that was one of my last questions I was at, talking with him about, and he sent uh, a, an email, and he talks about unlimited imperialism, where he said, quote, it says, uh, he's citing another source, he says, it's the unlimited imperialists along the lines of Alexander, Rome, Napoleon, and Hitler, who are now in charge of conducting American foreign policy. The factual circumstances surrounding the outbreaks of both the First and Second World War currently hover like twin swords of Damocles over the heads of all humanity. And he says this urge will not be satisfied so long as there remains anywhere a possible object of domination. So, you know, 
Russia and China, a, a politically organized group of men, which by its very independence challenges the conqueror's lust for power. Uh, so, you know, further thoughts, it, 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 as you said, it seems like they want to neutralize Russia, w- would you say? Yeah, I would agree with that. And, and um, you know, in discussing what James, um, you know, what he believes about certain things, I, I think um, I won't want to put words in his mouth or be, be um, you know, a substandard bearer of, of what his thesis would be. Um, but I, on that level, I mean, it seems like it's it's not a unified, you know, global plan that everyone is in on. I think there certainly is different kind of levels to this. Um, that there would be some at the top that would like to usher in kind of a global prison planet type situation, um, but I but I do think that at least it does appear that in in the midterm war is a great part of whatever that plan is or that shared agenda um, that you know different parties mutually would benefit from. Um, and and um, before we went on with the interview, there was a mid segment where you were talking about tensions ratcheting up it seems like all over the place and and i would tend to agree um it it certainly seems like there's storm clouds on the horizon and sort of to get your view or assessment or feeling of whether what's happening now in ukraine you know because this is developing over time we get new information so all of us sort of recalibrate our views which is just the the normal process but you know, initially, I'm a child that, uh, you know, I'm a Croatian-American, ethnically a Croat, and I grew up in the shadow of the war uh, in Yugoslavia, in Croatia, Bosnia, Serbia, and the tail end of the war when, in 1994. Uh, when I was a kid, I, I, I lived that year uh, in Split, uh, Croatia. Um, we were not in the immediate uh, war zone, so we were more or less all right, but some strange things did happen. And I, I saw for a while, well, at the moment, I see this conflict in Ukraine sort of going Yugoslavia style, where it kind of is dragging on for a couple of years. The West is sending arms and trying to keep it going. What are your thoughts on the potential for uh, escalation, uh, whether to the nuclear threshold or expansion? Because now we're hearing about Moldova, you know, this spilling over into Moldova and, and Poland and, and so forth. Right, yeah, and we we just had um, some news coming over today. I think it was today. I mean, there there's escalatory things appearing in the news all the time, but you have the United States and Great Britain providing longer and longer range rockets to to Ukraine, and I I think that it does seem like the at least the plan was some kind of a um, Zbigniew new Brzezinski plan, you know, give give Russia another Afghanistan from the 1980s. And I believe before he died, Zbigniew new Brzezinski was talking about repeating the same formula in Ukraine. Um, but of course, the more arms that you pour into Ukraine, they, they just seem to be disappearing into a black hole. Uh, but again, uh, the larger arms and and more sophisticated arms that you're dumping in there, like these rocket systems, have more and more possibility of being used to attack Russia itself. And it it would seem to me that that the plan is to give Russia another Afghanistan and make it drag on for years and years and years. However, there's a few things that seem like that it would get in the way of that plan, and and one of those is runaway escalationism. Um, providing rockets or providing different arms that would kick off and spread the conflict um, across borders. Another thing would be um, getting in a situation where where Putin feels like he's losing the war. And there have been people like Lindsey Graham talking about the possibility of nuclear weapons or chemical or biological weapons being used. And Adam Kinzinger introduced that AUMF into the House, which uh, seems to be just sitting there until the occasion comes out for it to be passed, the political willpower, pledging to commit the United States to a ground war in Ukraine if those weapons are used by Vladimir Putin. So it seems like you have a catch-22 here where – you know, Lindsey Graham was talking about um, trying to trap Putin into a situation where um, you know he feels like he has to use these weapons. Um, so, so you're trying to make sure that the war goes on just enough so that Putin doesn't feel like he's losing and has to resort to nuclear weapons or chemical or biological weapons, but also making sure that the Ukrainians aren't losing. And uh, it's just, I don't know, it's like, 
uh, I could think of an ana- <laughs> of an analogy where you know you put your arm in a hornet's nest, like you you you're plugging the hole, you can't pull your arm out because you'll get swarmed. But keeping your arm in is means you're getting stung. Yeah, and I would just uh, remind people, myself as a former professor of history and international relations, if I recall well my reading of history, we have in positions of power in Washington, in the Pentagon, for sure in Brussels, and I don't doubt either in in Moscow, everywhere, um, we've got psychopaths in, in some positions. If I recall in the 1950s during the Korean War, uh, I think it was General MacArthur who didn't have a problem with starting nuclear war with China uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Some of the Joint Chiefs advising JFK were up for nuclear war, uh, and there are further examples in, in history. So there is this real danger. We have literal psychopaths in positions of power, so anything can happen. And we're going to take our first break here. While we're on break, you can check out um, Patrick's website, libertyweekly.com net and find him on twitter at liberty underscore weekly we'll be right back here on tnt radio and we're back it's the hervoy moric show on tnt radio we've been talking to anti-war attorney researcher podcaster uh writer patrick mcfarlane who you can find at libertyweekly.net uh, and on twitter at liberty underscore weekly as well as uh, libertarian institute dot org i'm browsing some of his articles here and before we kind of continue on over to get your thoughts on china uh, i noticed you you had a a podcast episode this was uh, yeah uh, a month ago uh, talking about press censorship and wartime and uh, you mentioned my the deplatforming off of paypal in conjunction with consortium and minpress news and uh i wanted to get your thoughts on sort of censorship and and, and deplatforming it's because it's really next level, like what we are experiencing. It's beyond uh, Orwellian. And as Americans, for me, it's like unbelievable. Like 20 years ago, I grew up as a kid. I enjoyed so many liberties and, and freedoms. And yeah, sure, even back then, it, we were living in an oligarchy. But at least they sort of let us live with this nominal semblance of, of liberty and freedom. And now it's just full like Kim Jong-un you know, North Korean style. And in Canada, they're banning guns and introducing uh, b- at the border, like, uh, you know, they can search your phones and stuff now and freezing your bank accounts and Chile is going to ban guns. It's it's nuts. And so <laughs> what are your thoughts on censorship and, and the direction the West is taking? Yeah, it's really difficult because, you know, for the last maybe eight years or so, there's been this question in the liberty in the libertarian community specifically about, well, how do we deal with, with uh, censorship? And it's difficult for libertarians to answer that question because the answers that we have are not very satisfying, right? Um, some people would say, well, these companies are private companies so they can do what they want. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of making a mockery of that statement a little bit if you, if you can't tell by my inflection. Um, because I think that these these companies, these social media giants, are so in bed with the government, and indeed, you know, some of them have their links in Incutel, which is the CIA's venture capitalist arm. And so, in some way, I think that we can think uh, think of these social media giants as being extensions of the state apparatus itself. Now, does that mean that I want the government to get involved and in, in regulate these companies heavily? Um, I don't think so. So. Again, it seems like you have this catch-22 where it's like, well, maybe the answer from a libertarian standpoint is that you you just need to make a, an alternative that makes the former system obsolete. Uh, but again, that's not a very satisfying answer at all. So it's a bit of a, a quandary for libertarians to answer uh, the problem of censorship. But what I try and do is um, – I. In my work, I'm not necessarily a solutions-oriented guy. I know that some people are, and I try to identify them where I see them. Uh, There are alternatives that are functional out there like Float or the Fediverse or other other things like that. Uh, Those are social media alternatives. But I, I, in that podcast, I did try and take a look back um, and identify times in in past history uh, just exactly how bad press censorship did get. And I think that if you look in perspective, yes, affronts to the First Amendment have been very serious. Um, 
and what I did find in that episode, it was a bit shocking that most most of the media outlets during wartime, during World War II, World War I, and um, more recently, such as Vietnam and, and Korea, most media outlets voluntarily followed the government's rules. They didn't have to enforce it per se. Uh, but but I think another thing about that is uh, there were serious affronts to the First Amendment, but now we live in an age where media is so decentralized and I, I think that's kind of changing a bit, but I, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here with a microphone and my computer. I've been able to reach hundreds of thousands of people with my uh, content. And I think that in a way, the decentralization has presented a lot of people with truth in the way that they has never been revealed to them before, kind of akin to when Martin Luther translated the Bible to, I think it was the, the regular German at the time. So at the same time that there's a lot of very terrible, sinister affronts to freedom of speech, you know, especially as they've gone after you, um, we have to keep in mind that you know our voices are out there, where as opposed to there only being one or two radio channels back in the day, or you know, two channels on on the um, on TV. So it is difficult, and what we're dealing with is very sinister, especially with debanking, uh, but trying to trying to stay optimistic you know uh, because i think people need hope yes and that's a good point and why i i'm i'm more i mean people i mean we, we all we all have our different we all we're all different and i'm a bit more pessimistic or cynical but uh that's why i bring on people that are more uh, hopeful and forward looking no, and optimistic and uh, i'm the same way i'm the same way i'm more pessimistic <laughs> so i try to <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but at the same time, we just fight. We can't. It's like I always, you know, we've got all of those examples in history. We can look at three hundred, uh, you know, the film three hundred Sparta, where you know, even if, or I, I like to cite uh, Kiefer Sutherland and Young Guns too, and you know, Bon Jovi's Blaze of Glory. It's like you fight, even if uh, you go down fighting tyranny and evil, uh, regardless. And yeah, I've had on TNT the CEOs of Float uh, as well as uh, Jeremy Kaufman of uh, Odyssey, who's now running for. Send it in New, New Hampshire. So yeah, those are great uh, examples. Um, and then to get back then to China, y- your thoughts on on, on China? Uh, I've talked to people over the years, analysts who say that uh, are expecting World War Three, basically war with China, uh, t- closer to twenty thirty, uh, and that would the show would start with uh, you know the Taiwan issue. Perhaps uh, now I'm reading that China is. Uh, about to start work on its third naval carrier. I believe they have the biggest navy in size, probably probably not uh, you know in terms of force, but uh, and, and they're expanding with security deals. Recently, they were doing a tour, uh, you know, making deals with the Solomon Islands, Kiribati. So they're expanding in in that regard, and you know, I think that they've got the biggest uh, economy, uh, or it's you know it's going in that direction. What are your thoughts on uh, the China situation? Yeah, there's there's a whole lot to unpack there, and w- one of the big things that I've focused on is the this uh, populist right push against China because you you'll see a lot of uh, populist right figures, uh, politicians come out and say, well, you know, we're totally opposed to the war in Ukraine and everything that the government is doing to stoke tensions in Ukraine, but the reason why is because China's a big threat and we need to focus on encircling China. Um, well, that's the problem is that they, they say we need to focus on countering China, but they don't talk about all the things that we're currently doing to counter China. And, and I think that in the libertarian world, this is kind of, this, this has spilled over to, to pundits and at least in, in my neck of the woods over here, because they, they don't mention this Asia pivot and, you know, fly, um, sailing through the Taiwan Strait multiple times a year, um, the ADIZ air defense zones that is behind a lot of what you you'll see headlines, especially um, you know across the the right wing media talking about how Chinese warplanes are buzzing Taiwan, and it just turns out that they're flying through the ADIZ. Um, so, which which the ADIZ is it's an arbitrary uh, assignment of air defense zones, and the Taiwanese air defense zone actually covers over mainland China and covers o- hundreds of miles off the coast of Taiwan into the South China Sea. Uh, those are just examples, uh, you know, talking about arms sales to Taiwan, 
um, these patrols through uh, the South China Sea, partnering with other other countries like AUKUS, um, which is the United States, the UK, the UK and Australia, and these other um, kind of NATO-style Pacific alliances that are sprouting up, all these war games that are taking place. So that, that conversation is really left out of this narrative of counting China, or excuse me, countering China. And uh, people on the populist right will talk about, um, you know, dangerous Chinese fentanyl coming through the southern border or how uh, Disney is owned by Chinese, you know, or whatever. They're propagating Chinese narratives or or the NBA is owned by China and China's influencing the universities or buying all this land in the United States. Um, so I, I try to counter that narrative because there's not a lot of discussion that's taking place about these concrete moves that are happening um, in what is now called the Indo-Pacific, getting ready for this conflict. And one thing I like to focus on is the idea that China is going to invade Taiwan because um, even the Project 2049 Institute, which is one of the biggest um, think tanks in D.C. that helps to facilitate uh, arms sales to Taiwan, it's one of the biggest ones, and even some of their analysts are saying that a traditional invasion of Taiwan, the scale would have to be gargantuan in, in that it would take maybe 1.2 million Chinese soldiers, hundreds, at least thousands of ships to ferry them across the Strait of Taiwan, um, and that there's only five beaches, beachheads on Taiwan that would even be able to um, – that would even be suitable for an invasion force like that. So I think that if, if there is going to be an invasion of Taiwan, I don't think it's imminent. And if it did come, it would probably not take the form of a traditional D day type invasion that we would envision in our minds. And, um, I think one of the bigger questions is what does the United States have to gain by getting involved in such, such, uh, in a war with China, if that's, if that's what it would mean. I mean, how how does the average American stand to benefit from a war with China to protect the sovereignty of Taiwan? Well, they would gain, as Boyle says, unlimited imperialism, global, total global domination, full spectrum uh, dominance. And as, as you were pointing out, we all we frequently see memes um, and, and of, of maps where you see surrounding russia completely surrounded by you know a thousand u.s military bases nato bases as well as china and it's like and, and iran it's like well who's the aggressor and objectively it's it's the west is the aggressor and it's interesting as you mentioned you, you you've got all these think tanks and institutes in the west that are painting china as this expansionist aggressor where it's it seems it's the reverse uh, you mentioned AUKUS as well. Japan, uh, it seems like Japan, uh, they've floated the idea of uh, making it JAUKUS, uh, adding Japan. I wouldn't be surprised if Ukraine joined uh, yeah. the Asian <laughs> NATO. Uh, Lavrov actually made a comment the other day. He said, to all appearances, no one is going to even reform NATO. They are going to turn this defensive alliance into a global alliance claiming global military dominance this is a dangerous path that is definitely doomed to failure this kind of goes back this is my personal perspective regarding globalism and all of this that i personally see nato from its inception i think the goal was to become basically the world's military police force uh, in conjunction with the un being the world government it, it, it seems it's on that trajectory because in latin america they're making nato global partners like colombia and they're wanting to add brazil uh, and then they're creating an asian nato and they're just uh, expanding uh, insanely to take over the planet but we're going to take um our second uh, tamale or tequila break uh, right here while we're on the break you can check out uh, Patrick McFarlane's website, libertyweekly.net. Subscribe there, Liberty, uh, Insti libertarianinstitute.org, I believe, and at liberty underscore weekly at Twitter. Uh, stay right here on TNT Radio. All right, back on the Hervoya Modit Show and our final stretch with anti-war attorney, researcher, podcaster, Patrick McFarlane, who you can find at libertyweekly.net uh, and on Twitter at liberty underscore uh, weekly, and we've, look, we've been looking at Russia, 
China censorship, censorship, perhaps we could uh, turn toward uh, inwardly, domestically, to the home of the not so brave and home of the not so free. Uh, your latest uh, podcast uh, is titled Empire of Death, uh, Moral Bankruptcy. And so let's look at some things, um, some domestic issues. You know, what are your thoughts on the the Biden regime? It seems like Biden uh, has got a super low uh, approval rating. I think it was like 28 percent. No surprise. But he's basically like a zombie, a walking zombie. Um, and things are turning pretty authoritarian uh, across the land. Domestic terror offices are opening up, uh, so on and so forth. The economy is tanking. You know, your thoughts on what are some of the most important issues that you're looking at domestically? Yeah, I think um, I've written a little bit about the removal of due process during the COVID regime. Um, and, and I think that, you know, we've just seen a long, slow march through the courts of, of re- removing Fourth Amendment protections uh, removing due process. And uh, I, I think that it, it shouldn't be a surprise because of everything that happened, you know, it's happened over the years, but really accelerated after 9, 9-11. Um, we're, we're seeing another government by emergency situation uh, turn out here. I mean, the the fallout is still really occurring. Not, not only be, I mean, we're starting to see the effect that this had on our children, of of going to switching to remote and and making our children live two years through the the COVID regime, uh, but through the court system as well. I mean, in many places, you had jury trials being suspended indefinitely, and I think that if if you really go down to the brass tacks of exactly you know what are the essential uh, fixtures of a society, not just a free society, but a functioning society. And one of those uh, fundamental elements is dispute resolution. And when you have a court system that is willing to suspend jury trials indefinitely, then, I mean, they're really repealing the core foundation of what a civilized society is. And so once that happens, I think all gloves are off. I, and, you know, that reminds me, again, of my most recent interview with Dr. Francis Boyle, the author of the Bioweapons Act. Um, and he talks about how, um, you know, he's on all all of the terrorist watch lists. <laughs> Crazy. <Yeah. laughs> and how um, basically we've become a totalitarian police state. And he said how back in 2001, right after 9-11, uh, the anthrax false flag basically he he said he was the first to blow the whistle that that was used to push a domestic police state you know the in the form of the patriot act and all of that and that what's happening now with covid and monkeypox is that that's being used to uh internationalize the police state to make uh you know a global medical police state via the un and who so as you said emergencies are used to pass this insane uh, legislation. And uh, I saw you recently chatted uh, on Liberty Weekly with Clint Russell, who I met down here in Mexico uh, earlier in the year in Sayulita by Puerto Vallarta. There was a libertarian podcast sort of conference uh, gathering. I met him briefly. uh, And you were talking about the economic reckoning. We see $10 gas $10 $10 gallon gas in, in one gas station in California, uh, $8 gallon gas in, in Europe. It's it's also about $8 uh, a gallon now, which is crazy. Uh, inflation is just nuts. Uh, what are your thoughts on the economic situation? I remember telling um, earlier on in the pandemic, I remember telling one of my paralegals that when they decided to do the CARES Act, I remember telling him that that we were going to see crazy inflation and that I specifically said that milk was going to be like, I don't know, $6 a gallon or something like that. Um, and I, th- I think he, he thought I was insane. And I, it's one thing to say these things for years because I've, I've been a, you know, a big listener of Peter Schiff for a long time. And he's someone who always says, and, and this is something moreover with the Austrian School of Economics, is that the, the crash is always coming. We just can't say when. 
we can say what the result of a given policy will be, all things being equal, but we can't necessarily say what the timing is. And so ever since I kind of came into this in 2014, talking about the Fed painting itself into a corner, keeping interest rates for so low, so low for so long. And I think the, the surprising thing about it has just been how long that they've been able to keep it afloat. And especially now with this crazy, crazy spending, um, the crazy debt, um, it, it's just, it's astounding. And you don't want to believe what you've been saying for years that, that there's going to be a day of reckoning, right? We were talking about Ron Paul earlier, and that was one of his biggest insights is that there will be a day of reckoning and to see it all kind of happening around us, or at least to have it feel like it's happening around us is, is really sobering and kind of scary on a level that, um, I try not to grapple with because, um, you know, admitting that would be, uh, pretty heavy. Well, you you sort of don't want that because so much time has passed, which means the effect is going to be compounded and that much worse. You know, the higher you are, the far, far, farther you fall. I mean, this is the biggest debt bubble in the history of the planet. And right. it's, 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 it's biblical, it's proportions. And who knows, it may be even you know, myself as a, Christian, like there's a prophecy that uh, talks about towards the end times, uh, the global economic system collapsing, like completely, totally. And uh, who knows? Maybe, maybe that we're at that moment. But uh, you were also talking about moral uh, bankruptcy, and um, you know, I look at things a lot from a spiritual level uh, as well as uh, morals, you know, of, of of society. And it seems like. Uh, America, the West has degenerated on many points, uh, as well as what, what I think you're referring to as well, the hypocrisy and double standards of the rules based order. Right. But, uh, you know, do you have any other thoughts on, on that aspect of, of the decline, the, the moral bankruptcy? Yeah. Talking about it, I, we're, we're veering more into a domestic area, so I'll try and stick on that. But, but again, it's, uh, domestic and foreign. It's like, uh, the, a symptom of the domestic decay is this foreign decay. You know what the evil you allow to exist at home in your own government often expresses itself in foreign entanglements and going around the world, uh, waging war, being an empire, slaughtering civilians on on just an immense scale, and no one at home really caring or or having having the time to do anything about it being informed, trying to spread the word, anything like that. Uh, but in, in terms of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm right leaning and, and there's a lot of libertarians right now who are, uh, very concerned with the, the state of public schools. You know, there's a lot of people who are, uh, especially on the right concerned about things like drag, drag queen story hour and it's pride month too. Uh, but other things like I mean, I, I try to keep things in perspective because the last thing that I want is, you, you know, how the pendulum swings back and forth over the decades. Um, when I was younger during the 2000s, the pendulum seemed to be on the right with, with the, the Bush administration and the patriotism that happened in the wake of 2001 and uh, all these different things. And then the, the pendulum swung back to the left and has been there for maybe the past decade, maybe a little longer. And I, I'm just, I'm very afraid because each time the pendulum swings, it feels like it swings a little farther in both directions. And what I'm very afraid of is the pendulum swinging way too far to the right to correct for the insanity and the debauchery and degeneracy of the left right now. And my fear is, is that the, the counter reaction is going to be very strong and heavy, that it's going to be uh, very authoritarian to the right that a lot of these wars that people on the right have been looking for for a long time with China and Iran, uh, that they that the skids will be greased for those uh, for those things to go forward. Uh, but but witch hunts. I mean, what what do you do when you think that there are pedophiles that are grooming your children in schools? I mean, what do we do with pedophiles? There are people on the right saying they belong in wood chippers that you know they need to be lined up against the wall and things like that and. 
while I do have concern for the well-being of children, and I think there are abhorrent things going on, it seems like, I mean, libs of TikToks, um, it's anecdotally provides evidence of these things. Uh, but I, I just, I'm concerned that we need to make sure that we, um, we kind of temper ourselves and, and try to stay sober in how we're looking at these things. That doesn't mean problems don't exist and that they're not serious. It just means that we have to be self-conscious in any kind of rightward swing in the culture. You know, what you just outlined, I, I have the exact same feeling and I've been talking about this and my, you know, myself as a conservative, but I'm, I'm anti war, uh, anti monopoly capitalism, anti oligarchy, uh, you know, pro rule of law. And, you know, you mentioned, uh, pedophiles and mm-hmm. it, it, I think the law sh- should be applied. You know, you don't want to go witch hunting, but if someone did commit that act, the full force of the law should be put against them and whatever the con- consequences, uh, you know, should be according to the law. But, um, I do fear that this comeback of Trump, because uh, there's a lot of this QAnon, deep state stuff. I, I believe QAnon was a deep state operation, you know, like CIA, military intelligence. And it's play, it's I don't know the exact all the exact purpose, but it's really strange. And, you know, Michael Flynn is involved in some of that. And this kind of like MAGA movement. And I fear that Trump, Trump comes back like in 2024, as you said, and we'll have something like a new 1930s Hitler-like situation where this new right regime becomes um, authoritarian and, as you said, can start World War III because uh, you see on a certain sector of the right a very hawkish rhetoric on China and and especially on China, maybe to a lesser extent on on Russia. But And and then they would apply authoritarian rules and then any dissenter, it doesn't matter if you're right or left, any dissenter would just get, get into trouble. And so I think that's a definite scenario that I'm fearing. And uh, we got a couple of minutes left. I don't know if you have thoughts on that, anything else as well. There, I mean, there's talk of civil war. Right. I, I feel even the establishment would welcome a civil war because you're seeing it more and more in the Washington Post uh, and, and in other places. It's like they want us to go to civil war because maybe these globalist forces you know, want to polarize and you know, divide and conquer. And so you know, any thoughts along these lines? Yeah, I, I think more so than Trump, I, I fear a Ron DeSantis type. And and that's not because I think everything that Ron DeSantis is doing is bad, uh, quite quite the opposite. But the things that he does that are bad are really bad. Like, you know, his his Zionism support for Israel, his uh, hawkishness on, on Central American governments, uh, his Iran and China hawkishness, I think are, are very um, kind of alarming. Uh, but but. A comment on the last thing that you said about uh, you know the elites wanting a civil war in some sense. I I think that um, touching on what we said even earlier, I think in the first segment of this interview, uh, what is the global plan, right? And and I think more so, I've been thinking that if there is a global plan or some kind of shared agenda, I think is the better way to put it. I think that it'd be better to have like a an Orwell nineteen eighty four situation where you have competing great powers that are just competing in perpetuity with each other and the war switches from one to another, but there's always conflict between these three major powers. Um, and, and I think that, but, but within those three major powers, I think there is a shared agenda because even now we're seeing it, um, is that even in China and Russia, they're still advancing with the, the great reset type agenda and you would think that you know if these if um the multipolar world order was any different from the unipolar or the um the uni the unipolar world order if they were any different you'd think that the domestic policy would be different but instead i think we're seeing a shared domestic policy that's being advanced in a parallel way and so that's what makes me think that there's a lot of truth to this 2d and 3d analogy if you will yeah, and I can see both scenarios. Like, I don't think they mutually exclude each other because, uh, depending on how things go, you know, sometimes the uh, the elites don't get what they want, uh, and then they slightly change their plans. But uh, I could definitely see, as you said, this three EU like regional supranational states, as Orwell laid out, 
going at it so they could th- that that would work uh or um as well they break up i've seen some of you know the globalist white papers and it's like they want to break up, uh, everything up into small states which would then reintegrate like into a united states of the world like a world government uh, federation so i could see them going that way uh, as well but ultimately they want eu like regional un- unions eu is the blueprint for world government we got less than 2 minutes left uh, before i run out of time i was on to make sure you let us know you know where are the best places to find you websites uh, i also think you have a new newsletter as well tell us uh, all about uh, that yeah well i really appreciate you having me on um i left substack because their app started being going on google play and apple uh, and I think that Google Play and Apple are going to, you know, have influence over Substack. So I form LibertyWeekly.club is my newsletter site if people want to check that out. Otherwise, uh, my columns appear at LibertarianInstitute.org. Uh, they've been picked up by several different outlets, which I'm very appreciative of. Otherwise, uh, LibertyWeekly.net is the website. All right. Thank you uh, for coming on for the first time. Hopefully you come back uh, again. Uh, as well, don't forget the website, everyone, libertyweekly.net. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, and that'll do it for me today. But keep on listening here on TNT Radio. All right. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that interview. Thanks again for listening. Like, share, rate, review, subscribe, do all those things. LibertyWeekly.net. You can find tons of links, Odyssey, YouTube, Rumble, what have you. All right. Peace. Peace.